Well, thank you for joining us, everyone, um, at the Florida Horticulture for Health Network. Um, today, we're going to be hearing from our lovely panelists. <clears throat> um, the Florida Horticulture for Health Network offers resources focused on people plant interactions within and beyond Florida with website, quarterly EPUB cultivate, monthly chive talking eblast, Facebook resource hub, and webinars. The scope of the network includes horticultural therapy, landscapes for health, food nutrition, food action, and horticultural practices that combine human health and well being. We are now recording and thank you for all joining us today. This webinar is entitled Making Plant Sales Successful, and we're being joined by three lovely panelists who will be sharing their expertise in this matter. Uh, my name is Bree Stark, and I'm with the Florida Horticulture for Health Network. Um, and the, our panelists today are Siang Yu Thong, Alyssa Vinson, and Alan Boatman. I'm going to give a brief introduction for everybody, and then we will let them take it over from there. We're going to start out with Siang Yu Thong. Um, she's with the Therapeutic Horticulture Program at Wilmot Bot Botanical Gardens in Florida. Um, sorry, <laughs> the she received her certificate in horticultural therapy from the University of Florida and is also a certified permaculture designer and has her master's degree. She oversees the maintenance of plants in the greenhouse and co-coordinates the plant sales at Wilmot, Wilmot Botanical Gardens, which are held twice a year. The plant sales support the therapeutic horticulture programs and the maintenance of the gardens. The plant sales are held at its greenhouse and adjacent garden area. Many of the plants are, are, many of the plants for sale are prepared by program participants and some by the University of Florida students. The greenhouse at Wilmot Botanical Gardens is 2,700 square feet of climate controlled space used for gardening, offices, and therapeutic horticulture program. It is part of the historic Wilmot Botanical Gardens created in memory of Royal James Roy Wilmot, a founding member of the American Camellia Society. The greenhouse is one of several garden spaces on the Botanical Gardens 4.8 acre property that are free to the public, providing verdant green spaces, offering respite for patient, patients and their caregivers at UF Health, and a vibrant center for research and education in therapeutic horticulture. This space also serves as the site of its plant sales. Our next panelist is Alyssa Vinson. Alyssa Vinson is an avid lover of all things outdoors, spending her time in gardens, on trails, and in the water. She has been an environmental science educator for the past 15 years, working in Alaska, Oregon, and now Florida. She holds her master's degree from the University of Florida in ecological restoration and is a certified arborist through the International Society of Arbor Culture. Her current role as residential horticulture agent in Manatee County allows her to work with the Master Gardener Volunteer Program and the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program and the Florida Master Nationals, Master Naturalist Program. With an emphasis on resilient and sustainable landscape practices, her work spans ecology, horticulture, urban forestry, and volunteer and community development to deliver research-based education to the communities of Southwest Florida. And it includes plant sales delivered in conjuncture with the Master Gardener program. Their plant sales are held in the Barbara Davis Educational Gardens adjacent to Manatee County Extension Office. Participants, participation by Master Gardeners, Extension staff, and the public continues to build with each sale in large part because of the quality of plants and in part due to the beautiful setting for the sales. We also have joining us Alan Boatman, who has experience running plant sales at school and correctional facilities. Alan was born and raised in Titusville, Florida. He first entered into horticulture in 1994 when he attempted to grow roses and failed. 
leading him to try bonsai. After thoroughly enjoying that as a hobby, he went back to school at the University of Florida and graduated with a degree in environmental horticulture in 1997 and is now certified in agribusiness and ESC education. In 2012, Alan was hired at Lavoie Exceptional Center as an agriculture specialist teacher. He, is, he still holds that position and because of his love of plants, especially unusual plants, he instigated the Lavoie plant sale seen here on the school grounds. Lavoie's best plant sale to date has been just shy of $1,000, averaging about 700 per sale. The first sale at Lavoie netted $130. From 1998 until 2011, Alan taught at nursery operations, greenhouse operations, and succulent and vegetable gardening to minimal minimum security trustees in the Hillsborough County Jail System. Their first plant sale made $150. The last plant sale at the jail was made $3,000, averaging $1,000 to $2,000 per sale. The Falcon Bird Jail plant, plant sale involved other community groups, including the Hillsborough Master Gardener Program, which often provide an inf information table to boost, bolster plant education. Alan is a veteran and volunteers a good amount of time with his church and his community as well. So to start off, our first question for our panelists is going to be, what is the overall goal of your plant sales that you have been working on for your different programs? And if we could start off with Siang. Yeah, so um, at Wilmot Gardens, because the university doesn't financially support our program and the maintenance of the garden, our plant sales really go into supporting both of these um, aspects. So um, just any money or any proceeds that we earn during the plant sale will go firstly towards maintaining the garden. Um, and then second, it is to support any of the therapeutic horticulture programs that we have. So each semester, we run quite a variety of different groups, ranging from um, groups for people affected by cancer to students suffering from anxiety and depression. So um, the number of groups we have usually varies quite a bit, but all the sale proceeds would definitely go into funding these programs. All right, and next, let's hear from Alyssa. Uh, so um, at the Manatee County Master Gardener Program, our plant sales support our education and outreach, but they also serve as a way for us to um, access our community members and engage with them. Um, so, you know, we raise the, the money to support our programs through our plant sales. That's our primary fundraiser. We do charge for some of our um, educational programs, um, but most of them are, are no to, to a minimum um, fee. And so, you know, through raising that money, we reach somewhere between seven and 10,000 individuals in our community every year via our educational programs. And, and anything that we raise there at the, at the plant sale is, is going to go to support those programs, buying soil, plants, planters, uh, tablecloths, books, um, printing materials, all of those kinds of things that we need to run our programs, um, that, that money is coming from that fundraiser. Um, but it also gives us a unique opportunity to engage with 300 people at a time. Um, and so it's a really good chance for us to market not only um, the programs that we provide to the community, but also programs that are offered through our extension office as a whole. So we can connect people to resources that are available maybe through our family and nutrition program or through our C grant program um, by making that information available at our plant sales. Excellent. Thank you, Alyssa. Um, and now, Alan. You got to unmute, Alan. <laughs> um, so neither of the programs, um, well, at the jail, we were somewhat, we were partially funded by M8 Canteen Fund. At the school that I work at now, we are totally funded by <clears throat> uh, one private um, donor for our animal feed, but uh, nothing as far as um, monies from the school board or the district for our particular program. So we have to raise funds, um, both for doing plant things, 
and also for doing animal things. So basically the plants support both parts of the agriculture class. <clears throat> so uh, we have um, a number of people that help us with our sales. Um, we have about four or five people that help from the school and they get compensated with um, comp time from the principal. She um, gives them comp time for showing up for how many ever hours they show up for um, and the earlier, the better. Um, and we also have some master gardeners that still, that, uh, came along with us from the jail and, um, still help us with sales and also with informing, informing the public. Um, they are not operating as master gardeners because master gardeners can't, um, help for profit. Um, so they come on their own time, but they're a, a great resource for information. And that's one of the nice things about this sale is that it provides the local community with a lot of information on plants. Um, as we have a lot of people that transplant from other places throughout the country. And as uh, those that are from Florida know, it's a very different animal here growing plants. Um, so that's, and soil costs, what, six to $700 for a pallet. So, uh, for soils, equipment, um, all kinds of things like that. It's all self-funded from our plant sales. Excellent. All right. So um, we're going to go back to Siong and we're going to start with our first question, our, our first series of questions. Uh, what are the particulars of the plant sale at Wilmot Botanical Gardens? Yeah, so uh, we do have a small retail section in, in the gardens where plants are available throughout the year, but we have two large plant sales, and once in fall, once in spring, and actually the spring sale is coming right up. Um, shout out to anyone who's in the area. Our sale is on April 14 and 15, we're down in Gainesville. And so with these two sales, those are again, because one's in, one is in spring and one is in fall, the plants that we have for each of those sales vary quite a bit depending on the season. And our sale is, I would say that the people who come to our sale are pretty diverse. We serve a lot of students, staff, and faculty of the campus, but also because we have the hospital right next to us, we also have a lot of hospital staff and visitors who come to our sale. And finally, of course, it would just be the general public, anyone who is in Gainesville or from around the area. Um, these are some of the typical visitors or customers that we see at our sale. So we do have quite a wide variety of um, customers who come with a wide variety of plant wants and desires as well. So that's a little bit of a challenge and we can talk about that later on. All right, thank you, Siong and Alyssa. Yeah, so our sale, um, when I first started here in Manatee County um, in 2019, we were having one, one sale in the fall. Um, and one of the things we noticed is that a lot of the wildflowers and Florida native plants that we want to encourage people to grow in their home landscapes don't look great in October. Uh, <laughs> so we um, are switching now. The last couple of years, we've been doing a spring and a fall sale. Actually, our sale is coming up in the spring on April 29th, Saturday, April 29th. So if you're in Manatee County <laughs> um, and you want to come check us out um, and, you know, we serve as broad a clientele as we possibly can. We advertise in newspapers, through social media uh, campaigns. We try to get whoever and, and everybody and their brother to come um, to the plant sale. Um, we kind of average between 275 to 350 or so people who show up. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we have, have changed in recent years, when we offered the sale during the um, lockdown, we set up a kind of a pre-registration portal so that we could limit the amount of people who are in the garden at any given time. So it was a free ticket. People signed up on Eventbrite and we were able to kind of slow down that, that crush of people that usually happens right at eight o'clock because everybody wants the best plant right at eight o'clock, right? Um, and, uh, and so we kind of staggered that. And, and we liked that. We don't have to do that anymore, um, but we are continuing to have that kind of pre-sign-up 
it gives us an idea of how many people to expect. Number one, um, it kind of helps people uh, have a one kind of location where they can get information about the sale that's easy for them. They get those email reminders that say, hey, don't forget, you got to play at sale on Saturday. Um, and it also allows us a really easy way to collect email addresses for everybody who attends the sale. And then we can send along follow-up evaluations to them as an educator. Um, you know, part of my goal with having the plant sale is to figure out whether people are successfully planting those plants in their home landscapes, changing other behaviors related to planting plants and just, you know, how well they're doing, how they feel about it, all that kind of stuff. Um, as for some of the other logistics, the plants are raised exclusively, almost exclusively by our Master Gardener volunteers. Occasionally we do have some um, local nurseries or organizations who will donate some plants to us as well for the sale. But for the most part, we have Master Gardener volunteers who are raising the plants. We have a greenhouse here on site as well as another propagation area where we do most of that. Um, but then in the couple of days prior to the plant sale, Master Gardener volunteers will bring the plants that they have from home. We have a team of volunteers who kind of check those plants, make sure that they look healthy, that the pots are clean, and that they aren't um, on the invasive uh, or, or caution um, list for, uh, for plant species. We don't want to sell anything that's invasive or potentially invasive. Um, you know, we kind of have tried to focus a little bit with our seasonality. So spring plant sales focusing on, on flowering Florida natives and, and things like that that look really nice this time of year. And then um, in the fall, looking more at uh, focusing on, on edible plants because it's the time for people in our area to be planting their fall vegetable garden. Um, and there aren't a lot of good spots locally to get good veggie starts. So um, we're kind of trying to target those two different audiences. But then anything rare, unusual, pretty, right? We'll, we'll sell it all. <laughs> um, we have... Um, just some uh, challenges related to kind of money management. We have two cash registers that we have set up. We did use a credit card machine last year, but due to our um, we're within the UF finance system. And so we had to rent a credit card machine from UF finance, bring it down here. It only operates with an iOS device. So, mm -hmm. and that we had some compatibility issues. We ran into a lot of headaches with the credit card machine. So we've actually, we're just going back to cash and check again um, for our spring plant sale until some, some better option um, comes up and maybe we'll be able to try again in the fall. We usually raise between six and $7,000 um, for those. Uh, when we have two sales, when we were doing one sale, we would get about $12,000 at that one sale. So it seems to be about, about $12,000 annually is what we can expect to make um, at our sales. Excellent. Thank you, Alyssa and Alan. If you could give us some of your particulars of sales, season frequency, target audiences and such. You got to unmute again. I'm really not this technically challenged. Um, we have two sales per year. Um, we were having three, but the summer sales were uh, just people didn't want to plant during the summer because it was so brutally hot. Uh, however, this summer we were going to have a sale because I couldn't have my spring sale because I had COVID right before uh, we were supposed to have our sale and I didn't know if I was going to be well in time. Um, what, what types, of, well, let me back up. We have usually our first sale is at the end of October or beginning of November. Our second sale is in, uh, just the, the weekend right before spring break. Um, those two have seemed to work out best for the condition of the plants like Alyssa, um, alluded to. And, um, so that's why we have those two sales at that time. Um, this summer, having the sale in the summer is going to help us because we're going to have some veggies that are summer veggies that we'll be able to have at, at their going full bore by the time we have that sale. Um, types of plants, uh, great variety. Like um, we do herbs, we do vegetables, uh, seasonal vegetables, um, fruit and things like that. We have landscape plants, we have butterfly plants, we have plants of interest, we have succulents and cacti. Um, so uh, bromeliads, all kinds, you name it, um, we have something probably close to it. Um, as um, Leslie was talking about, we, we like to, 
um, concentrate on stuff that's not really common because if you can go to, Bo to Lowe's or Walmart and buy it, nobody's really going to be looking for it. However, we do sell our, our plants really, really cheaply. We only have the sale for about four and a half hours. And um, during that four and a half hours, we, we usually sell our plants for like $2 for one gallon, $4, $4 for a three gallon. So it's extremely cheap. Um, and nobody's really getting any kind of benefit from this except uh, altruistic benefit. Um, and all the monies go into the program. Uh, types of customers. We had a large group of customers that followed us from when I worked at, and taught horticulture at the jails. Um, so we had a following that way. Uh, I lost the list from the, from the jails as far as my email notification list. So um, I had to begin a new one 10 years ago when I started teaching at LaVoy. It's a really good thing to have, especially for your loyal customers, is to have them on email and also have people that come to the sales sign up on, on a sheet of paper with their email address if they're, if they're willing. Um, so you can just send them. I usually send them an email one month out so that they know we're going to have a sale. And then I send another email out two weeks prior to with a list of plants we might possibly have. And I always stick possibly in there because you never know if you're going to get hit with a mealy bug infestation or a drought or we lost water or something in the greenhouse. And so uh, those are considerations. Um, I also do some early selling and some people really get wrapped around the axle about that. You know, we have our, our plant sale hours are eight to 12. And, uh, but sometimes we sell to people seven o'clock or 7.30. We exist on our income from these sales. Um, these are suggestions. And in the notification that I send out, it says we could, we, we will sell before hours. It's just customer service will be spotty. And, but we're not gonna say no to money. At the jails, we had a specific time that we had to start because we had to accommodate the deputies that were coming out off a shift. And other people going in had to go in on a certain time. So we tried to accommodate them both, but we don't have to worry about that now. Um, plant stock. We have uh, a friend in South Tampa that actually does our most of our growing out. So I provide him with plant material and soil and containers, and he grows them out with his water and kindness and time. And then I go and I pick them up, which is just huge. Um, so if you can find somebody that can work with you hand in hand like that, then it's great. And I, I always go over there and spend a lot of time helping him identify plants. And I also give him some cool, weird plants too. Um, we don't do any consignment sales at all. We do have some donations from customers. In fact, they'll bring in plant material. We'll pot it up and have it at the next sale. Um, but we do not do any consignment. It's all profit goes back into the, the class. Um, <clears throat> we don't do any electronic sales and we don't do any checks. We don't do any electronic sales because we don't have the ability right now. Um, and I'm not going to do cash app or anything like that because it just gets too, uh, ethically entangled. Um, and the checks, we had two customers bounce a check and with the, the school district, if anybody bounces a check, that means immediately you cannot receive checks anymore. So it's solely cash which does sometimes cost us, but it's, it's the way it has to be. Um, and uh, that's pretty much, oh, the neat thing about these sales is it, it lets the community know about our clientele, who I'm teaching. They really can't do a whole lot as far as plant production. Um, so I'm pretty intensive laborious about getting these things together and growing plants and starting things from seed and stuff but they are a part of the process and they are learning that all of my students have an IQ of 50 or less and um, many of them are are physically handicapped as well um, so <clears throat> but the community gets to be exposed because I do have some students and families that come to these sales and they get to learn firsthand about what our program is about what some of the disabilities of our students are and um, so it's really a good educational thing for the, for the general public. And um, anyway, it does a service to them because it's cheap. So back to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Alan. All right. Um, and I just wanted to say before we move on to our next question that if we have some time at the end, we will have um, the floor open for quick 
question and answer. So if you have any questions that pop up while people are talking, you can either put them in the chat or you can just write them down and ask at the end if that's your preference. Um, all right, so going back to Siong, uh, do you have any plant prep tips that you could give us as far as, you know, who, who you have that prepare the plants and marketing and what, what do we need to know that you know? <laughs> Well, at Wilmot Gardens, a lot of our plants are grown by participants in our therapeutic horticulture programs. So that preparing the plants is part of their activities or um, some of the sessions that they come into the gardens for. So that's always helpful because, you know, we're kind of doing two things at the same time. We're fulfilling their needs through the activities that they're doing, through the plants that they're preparing. And then at the same time, they're preparing plants that go um, to our plant sale. But apart from plants that are prepared by our participants, we also buy a, a small amount of our plants. So these are, um, you know, plants that we buy from wholesalers. And these are mostly um, our outdoor landscaping plants and also some of our indoor house plants. So there's kind of a variety there. Um, because a lot of our plants are grown by our participants and a lot of our participants, you know, they may have mobility disorders, they may have um, special needs. And obviously, a lot of the plants that they prepare and grow may not be up to commercial standard. They're not going to be like the plants that you find at um, Home Depot or Lowe's or a garden center. But that's also one of the messages that we're sending out when we, we um, publicize or market our plant sale, that these plants are not meant to be commercial quality. Definitely when we're growing them and preparing them, they are still healthy. We keep them pest free. But one of the, the things that we're highlighting there is that these are plants that are prepared by people who meet these programs and who are benefiting from these programs in a different manner. So not necessarily in the aesthetics of plants, but really that engagement and sensory stimulation when working with the soil and, you know, working with all sorts of different plants of different textures, colors, smells, and all that. So that's one um, important aspect of the plants that we're preparing. Another thing is, um, I think the management of the, the plants that are growing in a greenhouse is quite a big thing for us here. We have one greenhouse for all different types of plants here. And it's challenging because a lot of the plants have different needs, different soil, watering, and light requirements. And all of that is kind of housed under one big greenhouse. And everything in the greenhouse, we do have a greenhouse, but we're kind of growing and preparing these plants as a home gardener kind of uh, perspective. So we water all our plants manually just because they all have such differing needs and everything is kind of just by our individual observations as we're going into the greenhouse each day, what needs to be done, what's doing well, which side or which area of the, the greenhouse would be best for this plant. All of that, um, I, I'm doing a lot of that right now as um, sort of, I'm the program manager, but I help out in the greenhouse a lot. We also have student employees in the greenhouse who help with the maintenance of plants. So from time to time, if there are plants that are prepared by our participants that we um, determine that may not probably survive or may not do well given the way they were propagated, some of our student employees may then step up and help with you know, amending some of the things. This could be removing some of the excess soil in the pots or helping to um, trim some of the cuttings if they were not done properly, just to ensure that they will still grow healthily. So our student employees are very important in our, our um, preparation for the plant sale. Apart from that, uh, marketing of the plant sale, we used to put up ads in newspapers, but we also know a lot of people don't read newspapers anymore. Um, so that has proven to be a little less effective, but we've also noticed that continuing to publicize or advertise the sales in the newspaper does attract a certain target audience. So it really depends on who you're trying to attract to your, your sales. What we've done in the recent years is we've moved to social media. So we have been posting a little bit more on Facebook and Instagram. And it always helps to, to show people what you have available, you know, just some kind of a preview or um, some sneak peeks of what you're preparing, 
Sometimes we put up pictures of our participants um, preparing the plants, of course, with permission from the participants. Um, yeah, just so people know what to expect before they come for our sale. Another thing we have also, I think what Alan mentioned earlier with emails, uh, we have our um, subscription list of, of people who want to be notified about what's happening in the gardens. So we send out emails to them prior to the plant sale. We also have a pre-order sale and the pre-order sale is uh, slightly smaller. So in pre-orders, we are only selling certain ornamental plants. Uh, we do have a couple of signature plants that people come to the gardens for, namely camellias um, during our spring sale. And then we also have like, you know, Christmas cactus during the fall sale. So these are plants that we typically would put on the pre-orders because people just want these plants. So we do a variety of ways to market our sales. And yeah, I think I, think I covered it all. Thank you, Siang. That was awesome. Um, all right. Uh, same question to you, Alyssa. Uh, any prep tips and who grows plants and your marketing strategy? Yeah. Um, so I mentioned that we um, we do occasionally get donations from individuals or local companies, but most, if not, I would say 95% of all the plants that we sell are grown by Master Gardener volunteers. We do have a greenhouse on site. We do um, we use timed irrigation. <laughs> We're not hand watering all the plants. <laughs> Um, and we do pride ourselves on having plants that would rival, you know, commercially available plants. I think that's one of the things our customers have come to expect is high quality and also, um, you know, rare and unusual or plants that aren't readily available. Um, we have a, a dedicated uh, small group of volunteers who really works hard to get flowering native plants that are available. Um, they're trying to really um, encourage the availability and use of those plants in home landscapes. Um, we have folks that specialize on bromeliads. We have a couple of folks that are really good at orchids. And so we have a couple tables in the greenhouse that are just full of orchids. And, um, and we price them according to kind of uh, an analysis of locally available similar plant material. So we, we tend to be just a little bit below or at kind of the market average in our area for those types of plants. Um, you know, as far as kind of growing tips, I was lucky enough to walk into a program where the plant sale had a long history. There's been a Master Gardener volunteer program in Manatee County since 1979. And so there's a there's a long history of, of having plant sales. And within the Master Gardener leadership framework, they have developed kind of a timeline, email reminders. So, so we have a, a core group of people who take on leadership roles um, and they send out email reminders to all of the Master Gardener membership, letting them know now's the time to put your seeds in. Now's the time to pot up if you haven't potted up. Here are some plant species that we uh, don't have anybody committed to growing yet. Can you grow some of these? Um, and, and so that really helps. Having that um, constant communication is, is really helpful. Um, and then as far as marketing is concerned, you know, we've done uh, press releases and that'll go to the local news media outlets, whether in a, a newspaper article or we'll occasionally have somebody from a, a you know, news channel that wants to do a on-camera interview. Um, we do post to our social media pages. We have um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the things. <laughs> Um, and, uh, we used to, um, pay to have a sign on, um, like a marquee with the city of Palmetto. Um, but we really didn't see any kind of uh, added benefit to that. And it kind of costs a lot of money. So we stopped doing that. Um, we do maintain a, a contact list as well, and we send out monthly notifications to them about other things related to horticulture. So we include plant sale marketing in those materials uh, as appropriate and um, just really lean on the social capital that is our Master Gardener volunteers um, and recognize that they have their own networks within the community and they go out and they share the information. Um, and, it, and we've never had an issue where we didn't have anybody show up. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Alyssa. And uh, same question to you, Alan. Prep tips, who grows your plants, and some of your marketing. You have to unmute. <laughs> I got it. Um, we, it's really good that we have a separate grower in South Tampa because um, about two years ago, our um, evaporative cooler 
caved in and um, our greenhouse is actually just coming apart at the seams, literally. And so we don't have the use of that um, or haven't had. And uh, so our partner helping us grow up grow those out is good. We do have a separate growing area uh, that's covered with some shade sails that were donated by a local club. Uh, they, they, um, we take advantage of a, of a grant from Riverview Garden Club and they have been generous the last um, what, four or five years that, that we have been at Lavoy. Um, so that's a good place. We have about three, uh, three by 30 foot benches that we're growing in the, in the shade. Um, plant tips, we, <clears throat> being a horticulturist, um, I get to help consult people both at the sales and also they're free. Everybody on the email list knows that they're free to contact me about any advice or questions that they need. Um, so I try, I try to offer that as a public service. Um, there's a lot of people that, like I said, coming from out of state, they're unfamiliar with the seasons that we have here in Florida or lack thereof and <laughs> what what is good to be grown during winter and what is good, good to be grown during summer and what kind of soil amendments that you have to use. Uh, succulents and cacti, there's a lot of people that think it, it, that are common waterers and then they take on succulents and cacti because they're cool and then they just totally kill them because they rot. Um, so uh, they, they're surprised when you tell them the biggest killer of succulents and cacti is water. <laughs> and um, so I can, we can educate them on that. Um, <clears throat> the soil amendments, you know, Florida's got, for the most part, the peninsula of Florida is sand. And so soil amendments are a big thing, especially if you're doing raised bed gardening or gardening in the ground. And um, we discussed that at the sales. I really, I really try to, to help people out the sales. However, um, it comes in waves, the customers come in waves. And so if you're really, really busy, you really can't spend that one-on-one -on -one time. So I, I kind of pass them off to a master gardener. And if there's no master gardeners available, I just, they, they have my email address. I tell them, hey, listen, I know we're busy, but contact me by email and let's talk about this because I want you to be successful with this. Um, by the way, I was eventually successful with roses. I just wanted to stick that in there. Um, the plants aren't grade one. Uh, I think Ms. Singh was, uh, was talking about that. It's, they're, they're, they're the best we can do with what we have and what limited resources and time and human power that we have. Um, and the customers know that. But the nice thing is usually when they take them home and put them in the ground, they do better than they did at our school. And so we were we were prepping them for the <laughs> for planting at home. Um, and I also educate the customers in the fact that a lot of times when you buy plant materials from the big box stores, they've been pumped full of uh, particular nutrients or pH adjusted so that they're blooming and have lots of green and, and um, lots of over fertilization. And to start, you can start to see the burn tips on the leaves and stuff. And I try to explain to them, you don't see the flowers on there now, but you'll see it about this time of the year. And if you do this, this, and this, you'll be able to appreciate this plant at its best. Um, we do concentrate on some natives. Um, and the neat thing is, is when we can combine the natives with the butterfly gardening or pollinator gardening, um, and people really get a big kick out of that. We do email to uh, private people, but also to newspapers so that we can be put on their, their schedule list. Um, we send them to uh, our extension agent, our horticulture extension agent here in, uh, in down in Hillsborough County. Um, and that person usually sends it out to the master gardeners and they send it out to their clubs. And we also send some emails out to local clubs and the clubs notify their members. So it's a little trickle down information there. Um, I also do some research to see when the sales and horticultural events are in my area because there's been times that we've doubled up with the USF Botanical Garden sales or somebody else is having a, a, an, an event like Greenfest or something and we don't want to compete with that and we can't compete with a lot of them because they have just really awesome plants um, that, have, that are very mature. Of course, they're really expensive and that's where we come in, but we, would, we don't want to compete with anybody. We just want to support the program 
We want to get good information out to the community and we want to get people excited about growing things um, because it gets them outside and they get away from the computer screens and the phones and they start um, participating with uh, the young kids start participating with grandparents. Um, you start talking about life. They find out, hey, these people aren't just really boring people. They actually know something and they've lived through life. Um, so it really is a good connector. Um, and also connect is, connects neighbors. You know, they'll see beautiful things growing and they'll ask them about it and they'll send them to our sales and we can educate them. I also tell, make it a point to tell our customers how to propagate these plants because if they can propagate that plant, maybe they'll donate some back to the program. Maybe they'll pass them along. Maybe they'll get more plants and then come back for different kinds of plants. But um, we have never given ourselves out of a sale. So we give them plants, tell them how to reproduce the plants, and they come back and get other stuff. And um, it really works out great. Excellent. Community connection. Love it. All right, um, back to Siang. Can you help uh, give us some volunteer management and utilization tips? <laughs> well, we, I know we don't have a lot of time left, so I'll, I'll talk about this very quickly. So yes. we rely on our volunteers a lot in both the maintenance of our plants, but also on the day of the plant sale itself. Um, a lot of our plant a lot of our volunteers are master gardeners or student volunteers. And so these volunteers have um, a diverse background in, in knowledge in, in horticulture or in plants. A lot of our master gardeners are very knowledgeable in plants. So they're always helpful to have around in plant sale. Because what we've noticed at plant sales is people don't just, you know, it's not like shopping for a dress or, or you know, buying a pot, you know, where you're just picking something off the shelf. People come and they have tons of questions about a plant. They'll ask you, where should I put this plant? Will it do well here? Will it, should I put it outside? Can I put it by the window? So there are a lot of questions and we love to answer those questions. I think as all of us are plant people, you know, our objective is not just to sell a plant, but it's really to be able to help that customer nurture that plant and help it grow successfully. Um, and also because outreach is so important, we want people to buy a plant and be able to get that satisfaction of seeing that plant grow once they take it home. So um, volunteers are very helpful in um, sharing that information. But one important thing, and I think this is a pretty helpful tip, is that we always tell our volunteers that it is okay to say, I don't know. We don't want to be spreading misinformation when we're selling a plant, just to sell a plant. So there are often uh, plants that, you know, we're not experts in every single plant that we sell. Master gardener volunteer A may know a lot about bromeliads, but then if someone comes along with a succulent, he or she may not know anything about succulents. And that's fine, it's not a fault of that volunteer. So we always tell them, it's okay, just tell them that you're not sure, you can look it up for them. Or we always ask the volunteers to direct those questions to either, um, I think we might have lost you, Sion. Mm. Well, maybe we should let Alyssa talk a little bit and we'll jump back to Sion when she gets back on. Yeah, um, so I, I would echo a lot of what Siang was saying, um, just in that, you know, recognizing the value of the knowledge that volunteers have and their ability to answer those client questions um, is integral um, to our sales. But also, I'll say my very first year um, as a horticulture agent here, we have so much embedded leadership and institutional knowledge through our volunteer base, individuals who have been with the program for 25 years or more. Um, and, and so on my very first year, I got really sick on the day of the plant sale and I couldn't be there. And so I thought, oh no, it's going to be a disaster. What's going to happen? And it was fine. Nobody really needed me. 
<laughs> to be <laughs> fun. <laughs> um, and, and so it was really a huge weight off of my shoulders um, in knowing that there's so much embedded leadership in the volunteer base. And so I think that, you know, tips for people who are organizing plant sales, trust your volunteers, lean on them, um, but also have clear and consistent communication um, with everybody and make sure that everybody knows what they're doing. Um, we have not just Master Gardener volunteers, but we also will have like FFA and 4-H students come and help on the day to be like wagon pullers and plant loaders and things like that. So making sure that they also have clear and consistent communication is is really important. And I'll and I'll leave it there and, and let Siang finish her thought. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. And I think that was all I had to say. So we can move on. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. And then, Alan, some uh, volunteer tips. I remember to unmute. How about that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, we really don't have a lot of volunteers except on uh, the plant sale day. And the majority of those are um, people from the staff from the school and admin from the school. And um, the staff are compensated with, with comp time. The admin just come out to be supportive of the program, which is wonderful. The difficulty is getting uh, motivating people to be out there so early because we get there at six o'clock and um, that's very early on a Saturday for not getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times it's hot or it's really cold. So it's very uncomfortable. And um, really just, yeah, you have to appeal to the altruistic heart of the person that's helping you. Um, and if they don't have the heart for it, then they're probably not going to show up and you don't have to worry about it anyway. You're just going to be doing that much more work yourself. Um, so I try to motivate the people that are, that are coming to help us, you know, with gratitude and remembering what they've done afterwards and informing them how much we made on the sale. Hey, this is great. This is what we're going to do with the money. People get a lot of buy-in and they start to have some ownership too as far as um, volunteers. So we've had a number of repeat volunteers. And as I said before, we do have Master Gardeners that set aside their Master Gardener ID and come in and help us with plants and sales. And, and But most of, most of what they do is educating uh, the public at our sales. We do have that one volunteer that grows out the majority of our plant stock. Um, I don't... I guess he probably gets tired of me telling him how grateful I am for what he does. Um, but also we do have a lot of shared interests, which helps a lot. And uh, his wife is very helpful too. So <clears throat> that's pretty cool. Um, and we also have, we have our benefactor that actually helps us pay for the, for the animal feed, which is separate from plant sales. He actually came to us because we were, we were specializing in peppers at the sales uh, when we were at the jail and that got his interest. So a lot of times what you'll have out there will bring interested people that become volunteers and become uh, benefactors. Um, so that's really important too. Excellent. Thank you, Alan. Um, so to kind of compress this for time, I was going to just kind of combine the, uh, like one sale day is one sales day tip, um, one challenge and one positive net result for each of our panelists. So starting with Sion. Sale day tip. Hmm. That's a good one. So my from my personal experience, I would say if you're the organizer of the plant sale, one tip I have is to not assign yourself a role during the, the actual day itself. So you should kind of be floating around on that day. You know, um, don't tie yourself to a desk or to a specific role, such as being a cashier. But really, um, I think having volunteers or staff, if you have any, to take on those roles would be helpful because then you get to kind of step away for a little bit and just be around where you're needed. Uh, that helps a lot. So that's my tip. Um, chat was the second question about the challenge of a sale? Uh, yeah, just challenges of either the sale day or preparing for the sale. Just one of the main things that comes up in your mind. You can actually think of two, so two short ones. So one of the challenges 
it's the bugs <laughs> because we grow a lot of our plants in-house um, and we don't spray any chemical or synthetic uh, pesticides. We um, we do occasionally run have run-ins with bugs and, you know, it's just something that you kind of have to manage and be um, mindful of as you're working with the plants. And we want to be careful not to be selling plants that have bugs on them to customers. The second quick one is um, putting out that information about all our plants. Because like I mentioned earlier, a lot of people come to our plant sales um, having a lot of questions about the plants that they want to buy. And it's always tricky for us to share all of that information. We sell over you know, 4,000 plants at our plant sale. So it, it's hard for us to be able to share every plant informa information about every plant to people. So one of the things that we've been doing in the last couple of years is printing out all those light and water requirements onto a plant label and putting it into each of those pots so that when customers bring them home, they have all that information with them. Finally, a net result. Um, I think for us, we see a lot of positives coming out of the sale. Definitely, we have we have been able to raise quite a fair bit of money for our programs. I would say, I don't have the figures with me right now, but on average, we come up to about a revenue of 17 to 18,000 per sale. And um, apart from just, you know, financially, we have also increased awareness of our programs. A lot of our volunteers and um, support, you know, be it um, in terms of manpower or financial support, a lot of them come from the customers who have been to our sales. And then finally, I think we also have been building up a good group and network of volunteers who have either heard about sale, um, come to our sale, heard about what we do and want to join us, or just the regular volunteers that we already have. Um, you know, being able to participate in a meaningful sale and being able to, you know, interact with all these plant lovers, that has really kept our group of volunteers growing and that's something we're very, very thankful for. Excellent. Thank you, Sion. Um, and Alyssa? Yeah, um, so I agree with uh, Siang's tip on not giving yourself a job, uh, making sure that you're able to float around and solve those uh, little problems as they come up. I would also add to that just like being able to remind people that this is fun. This is a <laughs> plant sale. People are buying plants today. Let's talk to them about plants, right? And um, not letting those those little challenges turn into a big crisis where people, you know, end up in some kind of conflict. So, um, you know, that that's definitely let, let it roll off your back. Remember that it's a plant sale, that it's fun. Uh, challenges for us, you know, we had a lot of challenges related to our credit card machine last year. Honestly, um, I was playing IT specialist for about two hours out of the whole day trying to make the thing work. Um, and so I think making sure that, you know, you're testing all of that stuff really heavily beforehand and you have access to it beforehand. And then also I would say for us, we've, um, you know, we have a lot of uh, kind of embedded procedures related to our plant sale already and, and learning how to be flexible um, is sometimes a challenge because we have such embedded procedures um, and, and we've had a sale for so long. Um, you know, and I, I would also add into that, you know, when we change to the University of Florida finance system, we have new rules for calculating sales tax and reporting sales tax. And there's a lot that goes into kind of counting all of the money after the fact and getting it where it's supposed to go and and all of that. Um, net results. We get to talk to 300 people about plants. I mean, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, people come to us that have never been to extension before. We see whole families coming in and buying food to plant in their home landscape. So yeah, every plant sale um, has a moment of kind of that, you know, everybody in education talks about that spark, that moment when somebody's like, oh, that's, I can do that with that plant, or that's where that can grow, or this is good for, for, you know, butterflies. So cool. Um, so, so those, those are all the positive outcomes that we see. Excellent. Thank you, Alyssa. And Alan. Yes. Um, people will be patient to pay for plants, but try not to forget who's next. 
um, because we don't have them come to the table. We have them stay with their plants and then we come around and check and, and give them a, a re the receipt and then they go to the, the table and pay. So just be patient. They'll be patient. And um, uh, if they're not, it's usually the people that would like one or two plants. <laughs> so, but um, be the be the professional and personable. Uh, the challenge of the sale, uh, people, people have tried to negotiate plant sale prices with me for 25 years. Um, our plant sale prices are below wholesale. Um, but even if they weren't, this is, this is for a good cause. Um, they're actually helping out a charity. You know, all, all three of us, they're helping out a charity and they should know that. And if there's a problem with paying the price that you're charging, well, they don't, they don't have to be there, but you don't have to say that, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's pretty much it. Uh, your net results, any, like a positive net result. Oh, for me? Yeah, for you. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> positive. So we ended on, so we ended up on the upstroke. <laughs> yeah, sure. No problem. Um, positive net results is, is that we had the funds to do the things that we need to do in the class and also add new things to it. Um, and it's, it's a really good cycle. The people that, that come to the sales actually get a good value. They get to take home the plant plus the advice and an ID, and they have access to me for information. And the kids get to benefit from the reinvestment of those funds into the classroom and, and the activities that we do. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, once again, our panelists were Siong Yu Thong, Alyssa Vincent, and Alan Boatman.